Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Tony Scott to the stage. Well, good morning. Um, I hope all of you enjoyed the first day of the conference. I know some of you really enjoyed the first evening of the conference. Talked to a few people who were claiming they were overserved last night. That's okay. It's all part of getting together and exchanging ideas and, and having fun. So um, I'm, I hope the excitement uh, from yesterday, uh, and I know it will, continues through the day today. Uh, my job this morning is to introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, who's General Services Administrator Emily Murphy. Um, Administrator Murphy leads a staff of over 11,000 employees nationwide, uh, overseeing more than 371 million square feet of property. I can't even get my arms around how much that really is. And approximately 54 billion in annual contracts. Prior to being confirmed as administrator, Mrs. Murphy uh, served as senior advisor to GSA's acting administrator. And in that role, she helped guide the merger of the Federal Acquisition Service and the Technology Transformation Service and advised on opportunities to improve how GSA facilitates technology purchases. That's a big job just by itself. And prior to that, she served at GSA from 2005 to 2007, where she was appointed inaugural chief acquisition officer and led the transformation of the agency's uh, assisted acquisition centers and the consolidation of the Federal Supply Service and the Federal Technology Service. Administrator Murphy also served as GSA's representative to the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council and the leader of the Civilian Agency Acquisition Council, which are responsible for procurement regulations. In that capacity, she modernized the FAR and the GSA regulations to reflect the government's increasing use of service contracts as opposed to commodity buys. So with that long introduction, please join me in wel welcoming Administrator Murphy. Good morning. First of all, thank you, Tony. I really appreciate that introduction. It's really great to be here with all of you this morning. There are a lot of friends in the audience. There are a lot of colleagues. I think, is there anyone left at GSA and Central Office? <laughs> um, and it's great to see our customer agencies here and our vendors without whom GSA really couldn't accomplish its mission. When I heard that this year's theme was imagination and that you wanted me to discuss how we innovate for mission delivery. I really thought that was a great challenge. I thought it would be a great opportunity to talk about how we're reimagining GSA and how we are trying to better fulfill our mission. Now I'm a Missourian, so I talk a lot about the history of GSA, that Harry Truman came up with the idea as he was driving around Missouri during World War II and saw all the problems with procurement and construction, thought there had to be a better way to do this. So when he became president, he asked uh, former President Hoover to form a commission, and GSA will turn 70 years old on July 1st of, 19, of, of next year. But I think it's important to remember that our mission today is just as vital as it was 70 years ago. We still strive to deliver value and savings in real estate, in acquisition, in mission support services, in technology, but it's how we deliver the mission that's evolved. We've been trying, we no longer are the GSA that had, has mandatory you know, uh, supply lists or warehouses full of goods. We're a GSA that's much more agile and much more responsive to the changing needs of our customers. So the challenge I've got is how do we reimagine how we deliver on that mission? How do we figure out how to better engage our employees? How do we better serve our customers? How do we create opportunities for our vendors to better provide solutions across the government? I'm going to share my ideas, but I'm really going to save some time at the end so that we, for feedback. I like questions. I hope this can be a dialogue. So I'm a visual person. Um, I thought I would try and come up with a picture of how I, I, I see GSA in the future, and then they're going to try and put this up and see. Oh, good. All right. Um, I think that really there, we have our people, four enablers, and three focus areas. 
And first I want to talk about people, because without people, nothing's possible. And as I said, many of them are actually here today. So the first thing we have to work on is how do we continue to recruit the right people? How do we retain the, the quality workforce we have? How do we reskill that workforce so they can take on new challenges? And how do we recognize them? How do we say thank you? Part of that's thinking big, and I think Margaret Weikert was here yesterday talking about ways we can think big. GSA, the last few years, has asked for a billion dollars for a workforce fund. But part of it's also about thinking small. And I said, saying thank you more often, really appreciating the way that people are making a difference, uh, the, trying to just get out and talk to folks and, and you know, really share the vision, but also hear from them, because there are some brilliant people I have the privilege of working with and getting their ideas. Part of supporting them also, though, is giving them four enablers so that they can fulfill that mission. It allowed them to transform what GSA is doing to higher value work. The first of those is IT modernization. That's not a surprise to anyone here in this room. Whether it be the technology modernization fund or the work we're doing with robotics process automation, tools enable change. I know that we've got Alan Thomas here in the audience and Suzette, you're gonna hear from Suzette Kent tomorrow. I know that they've talked quite a bit about how we're using technology to really drive forward the president's management agenda, but also GSA's evolution. The second area I want to talk about is customer experience. It's not a, it, it should not be a surprise to anyone that GSA was the first agency to have a chief customer experience officer. And I think Anahita O'Reilly is here, or Anahita O'Reilly is here in the audience somewhere. Yes, there she is. Um, I know that she spoke yesterday. But she's been taking a lot of the data that we've gotten from our customers, which brings me to the third one, analytics, and trying to figure out how we do a better job in delivering for our customers. How do we use data to drive value? And then finally, we need change management. It's critical to our long-term successes. And we simply can't will change into being. It's gotta be something we really in, in, uh, inculcate into the agency. So where does that take us? First area, it would be acquisition. GSA is working to create a new federal marketplace. Schedules have been evolving. If you think about when they were first created, they were created to buy things. Uh, when I was at GSA in 2005, we started working on changing our regulations to recognize the fact that GSA was actually buying services. They were helping agencies buy services. But if you look at what GSA is enabling now, it's not goods, it's not services, it's solutions. So how do we evolve so that we provide solutions? I think we've got a couple of good first steps. The order level materials rule went into effect earlier this year, which allows a lot more, uh, up to a third of the price of any task order to come from off of schedules. We're working on the uh, commercial marketplace, and I think that will help us address the small dollar value items. But I think the work that Alan Thomas and Faz have been doing on the schedules reform is really visionary. They've taken, they're looking at taking 24 schedules and reducing those, improving the catalog, including the new authority we have to have unpriced services contracts improving the ordering tools, all of which were the key complaints from our customers. So what does that do? That drives competition for solutions. By having an unpriced task order, for, you know, if we unprice, I'm sorry, an unpriced contract for services, we don't have our 1102 thinking about the ceiling price. We instead have our 1102 talking about task order competition and how do we do a better job at capturing past performance. We enable our agency customers to buy that solution, we enable our industry partners to deliver a solution. And it allows us to reimagine how the 1102 is gonna be functioning. It creates a, a really dynamic pricing in our marketplace. The second initiative I wanna talk about, I promise to be brief about it because I know when I start talking about public buildings in this room, um, I'm not going to get the warmest reception. But I wanna talk about it because it's exciting work. And it, I think what you're gonna really be interested in is the tactics they're using and the results. So last year, fiscal 18, the public building service delivered eight, or I'm sorry, $900 million in lease cost savings for our customers. They expect to do that again this year. So the question is, how are they doing it? Well, they went back to the principles of analytics. They, they went in, they dove into the data on the leases and figured out where there was the greatest opportunity for savings. They went and they worked with the people and deployed them on those areas where you had the opportunity for savings. And now they're working to bring technology in and they've been using robotics process automation. And there's actually one initiative that they're hoping to launch this year that 
in and of itself will save 10,000 hours of work a week. If you think about that, that's five years for any, for any individual person. That gives us really that ability to reskill the workforce to high value work. Finally, I want to talk to you about shared services. The president's management agenda put GSA as, as a co-lead on the cap goal for sharing quality services across government. And they gave us an ambitious goal. They said, we're spending $28.6 billion on those services right now, but our customers aren't happy. They gave us the challenge of saving $2 billion, but also thrilling our customer. And we're trying to do that. The first steps took place in fiscal 18. At the end of, of September, we awarded the new pay contract, which is a $2.5 billion contract done as a software as a service procurement, and we're expecting savings of up to 75%. With fleet, where GSA already manages about a third of the government's fleet, we've been deploying things like telemetry, so we get better data, so we can better manage the fleet, and we're finding that when we, we take over an agency's fleet, we deliver usually 26% savings to them. And then we've got the centers of excellence. And we've, I have to say, we have the most wonderful partners in USDA and HUD. Um, HUD, we're just kicking off. We've got a meeting at the White House tomorrow to really officially launch the, their center of excellence. And I know that Secretary Sensky is going to be talking to you in a minute about everything that USDA is doing. But we've got some really good early wins. With data center consolidation alone, we've been able to close 21 data centers. The goal was 18. That means 6.9 to eight and a half million dollars a year in savings for USDA. We've got data. The uh, dashboards that USDA has now that were developed using the COE are amazing. They were so good, I saw the demonstration. I had dashboard envy. I brought the center, I asked the people from USDA to come over and do a presentation to GSA. And so they came into our senior staff meeting, and I'm meeting with my data practitioners next week to find out why I can't have these dashboards too. But it's really driving a culture of change, where you're embracing all the opportunities that technology creates, how it allows us to provide better customer experience. And I'll let Deputy Secretary Sensky speak more about what he's doing, but it's really exciting. Uh, also, I want to talk about HRS, the Human Resources Solutions at, at OPM. That's moving over to GSA. I think it's an incredible opportunity to improve our, how we're delivering services to our workforce. We have a great relationship with Margaret Weikert, who is now the acting director at OPM, and I know you all heard from her yesterday. But we're already delivering savings. The HCATS contract, which was jointly managed by GSA and OPM, we've been able to reduce the fee from 2% to 3 quarters of a percent. And that's good for our customer agencies because it costs them less. But frankly, it's good for our vendors also because it makes their solutions easier to access. We're looking at opportunities that cross the agency. So in the public building service, we provide space. The federal acquisition service and technology transformation service, we provide technology that enables employees to work better. And then we've got the telework group in HRS. Coming together, I think we're going to be able to deliver a better solution for federal workers. And this opportunity to create greater value is really where I see GSA evolving. All of this leads to key outcomes. In fiscal 18, GSA was able to save or avoid $6 billion in costs for taxpayers and for our customer agencies. Our goal is to save $6.2 billion in fiscal 19. We're looking to simplify how, it, how we work with you and with, uh, with our vendors, with our customers, whether it be through schedules modernization, whether it be through adopting things like robotics process automation and blockchain and artificial intelligence, and we're looking to reduce the burden that we put on our vendors. We're looking to increase satisfaction. I want happy customers. I want a great relationship with the industry, and I want a workforce that's motivated. We have the best driver. I mean, the federal government has an incredible mission. And being able to deliver to our workforce the opportunity to deliver on that mission in a way that they feel that they're delivering high value every day would be a real success for GSA. So this is how I'm reimagining GSA. But I did want to make sure that I didn't use up all my time, and I saved time so that I could ask, open it up for feedback and questions. Is anyone going to take me up on it? <laughs> Thanks.
please. Uh, I have a quick question about the interface that we have for Schedule 70. Uh, it's still like, you know, 90s. So do you know when that will? I think that's being generous to say it's a 90s interface, but okay. Um, yeah, when we're talking about schedules modernization, it is, you know, it's everything from how do we catalog, how do we make search tools, how do we make it easier for vendors to provide us with their information, how do we make it easier for customers to find that information. We do a, a survey every year of all of our customer agencies. The number one complaint is that it's hard to find the product or service that they're looking for. If, if you're trying to sell something or facilitate the sale of something and people can't find it, that's a problem. So I mean, the, the work that Alan Thomas and the team in FAST is doing to try and take the data that Anahita and customer experience gathered on that and turn it into actionable items on how do we train, modernize those systems so that it's easier for our vendors to deal with us, it's easier for our customers to find the solutions they want. Hopefully it also means if we've got fewer schedules, you don't have to submit the same paperwork in multiple places as well. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate your thoughts. Um, we're seeing a dramatic transition to X as a service business models, particularly mm -hmm. with cloud-based transitions and IT modernization. Could you talk a little bit about how GSA uh, is addressing the need for consumption-based pricing and metering and things that raise anti-deficiency problems going forward? All right, so Rich is, give, is setting me up here. Uh <laughs> because this is something we worked on on the Hill together. So the, uh, it, this is one of the challenges we have when we're looking at the cloud. How do we make sure that we're buying, uh, that we're getting the best value? And a lot of the rules we have right now force us to buy as if every day, if, for the IRS and every day is April 15th. So we always have to be looking at the maximum amount we can consume rather than buying on the per drink. And we're working to see if there are ways, the creative ways we can address those problems. We're looking at legislative solutions as well. But I think that even with those constraints, we're still seeing an enormous return on investment as we move to the, you know, as a service to the cloud models. It, it, the savings across GSA and I think for our customer agencies have been very substantial. Okay. Hi, Emily. Thank Hi. you for being here. Um, since this is imagination, yes. and I've put you a little at risk here to project yourself out five years. I know you're looking at commercial marketplaces now. Right, you're gonna have the integration of OPM moving in. Where do you see GSA in five years? And where do you expect industry to, to be that partnership? And again, it's about imagination and we're here just to kind of vision out in the future. All right, so if I were imagining GSA in the future, all right, the, on the federal acquisition side, I would think that we have a lot fewer vehicles. Um, frankly, that takes a lot of the work away from, from our industry partners and in trying to submit, as I said, duplicate paperwork across the, across the agency to different contracting officers. You don't have you, know, a, you don't have differences in how contracts are being administered. But you also then, if by having a more a, a federal marketplace rather than 24 schedules, you have the ability to go in and buy the solution you need rather than trying to fit it into one of the boxes we've created. Uh, with other shared services, and I think one of the great things about working on shared services is that GSA exists to provide shared services. Uh, we're calling the mission support services or quality services now, but if you look back at smart pay, if you look at the work that's happened in fleet all along, the, the, you know, the offerings, the schedules themselves are a shared service. So how do we make those more accessible? And I think by bringing HRS into GSA, we're gonna see a lot of efficiencies. Uh, I, I, I gave the example earlier of, of when we're talking about telework and how there, there's the ability to really leverage the, those opportunities. I'd say another area is that when you look at the USA job suite over at OPM, and then you look at how uh, we've got the SAM IAE suite in GSA, they're not the same, but they use very similar technologies and very similar processes. So how can we learn and leverage those two uh, and, and do a better job in delivering that service? Thanks. Hi. What can be done to speed up the purchase of emerging technologies? That was one of the topics of our techno sessions yesterday. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and GSA, I, I know that along with DHS and with several other agencies has, been look, has really been focusing on how do we do a better job in that area. We've got our commercial services offerings that we've been making available. We've got a first few awards that have gone out. We've also been partnering with SBA and with other agencies on the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which most people are only familiar with in sort of concept, but we've been 
actually GSA is now doing phase three awards to the commercialization. And we saw, I want to say, close to $150 million in awards in uh, August, or I'm sorry, in September alone using that program. So it's giving us the ability to bring more and more of those emerging technologies in, out to our customer agencies, and then hopefully uh, then also capture them into our package, a suite of offerings. So I think it's a great way for GSA to leverage those. Are there other things that need to be done? Yes, and I think that we're, we're watching what Soraya is doing at DHS, we're looking at what DIU is doing over at DOD, and, tr and trying to continue to learn from them and support them. Thanks. There's one, and there's one over there. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership at GSA with respect to RPA. I believe that this technology is going to revolutionize how the government does business. As a taxpayer, I want to thank you. As a vendor of RPA services, I also want to thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I'll have to say, so I, one of my first goals as administrator was to get out to the regions. And the very first region I visited was New York. So I made it up to New York City, and Jeff Lau, who's with the Federal Acquisition Service there, it wasn't on the schedule, but it found half an hour and, and showed me a demonstration of how he was using RPA to speed up certain processes. And I just thought, this is the most amazing thing. We need to be doing a better job of adopting this. And so he's continuing to push forward. Public Building Service is pushing forward. Our CFO's office is pushing forward. Obviously, our CIO's office is pushing forward. So we're seeing just a lot of great innovation in GSA on those fronts. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Amber Corrin with Federal Times. Um, so we've been hearing a lot about change, about transformation, IT modernization in various ways. Um, we've also previously heard about the president's plans for reorganization. So I'm curious about how you're approaching all of this change with the workforce. Um, how are you working with them to kind of institute this and get the cultural buy-in? So the very first thing after uh, I did after the the president announced the re, uh, his reform plan was sent out an email to GSA's workforce. Within less than a week, did a agency-wide town hall. We learned some of the limitations of our technology at that point in time. We've grown from that. Uh, we've been doing a lot of videos and communications. We've got a working group that's mainly comprised of career employees at GSA uh, that, that have been informing how we're going to be doing th this merger. OPM has a similar group. They've been very engaged. I'm actually doing another agency town hall at the end of the month. So it's been a lot of, I want to say big communications, but it's been a lot of small communications also. I've been out, um, I've tried at least once a month to get a group of, of mid-level employees to come and have coffee with me and just talk about whatever they want to talk about, and this always comes up as a topic. So it's, it's just been a great way to engage with our workforce, and I think that they see a lot of the opportunities that this is going to bring. All right, well, that's everything. I really do want to thank you for the opportunity to come here today and talk about how we're reimagining GSA. Hopefully, in the next two years, I'll be able to come back and say, we have a federal marketplace in place. We have a, a, a strategic leasing initiative in place. We have a shared services initiative that's really delivering services. And at the end of the day, we've increased savings, satisfaction, and, and simplification across governments. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Administrator Murphy, for sharing your thoughts with us today. We in the acquisition community rely on GSA for so much of what we do. So from helping us buy more efficiently to supporting our information systems and our regulations, we are very fortunate to have you at the helm. So thank you again for being here today. I would now like to introduce Deputy Secretary Steve Sensky. Mr. Sensky is the Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He was sworn in on October 11, 2017, after being unanimously confirmed by the Senate. Mr. Sensky previously served for the past 21 years as CEO of the American Soybean Association, a national not-for-profit trade association that represents U.S. soybean farmers on policy and trade. 
Mr. Sensky began his career working as a legislative assistant for Secretary or for Senator Jim Abnor, and later he served in both the Reagan and the first Bush um, administrations at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, eventually serving as administrator of the Foreign Agricultural Service. Mr. Sensky received his B.S. in Agriculture from South Dakota State University and his postgraduate diploma in Agricultural Science from the University of Melbourne in Australia. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Sensky. Thank you so Thank much. You. Well, good morning, everybody. What a great pleasure it is for me to be here with you here today and have this opportunity to discuss our IT modernization efforts at the Department of Agriculture. I also want to thank Emily Murphy. Thank you for that, for opening us up this morning and for that great overall presentation. And thank you also for our service. Uh, great to be working with you, Emily. So thank you very much. I want to tell you, as an agriculture economist like me, how intimidating it is to talk about IT modernization with a room full of IT professionals. I was uh, talking to uh, Gary Washington, who's USDA CIO, and I, uh, he said, don't worry about it, Mr. Secretary. Just remember, you know, that old adage you learned in school, if at first you don't succeed. Uh, he said, but we in the IT community have a little bit different twist on that. If at first you don't succeed, call it version 1.0. When I talk about IT modernization, I'm reminded of, and what a challenge that is, I'm reminded of that story of the man who was walking along the beach, and he saw a bottle, and he picked it up, dusted it off, and poof, out popped a genie. And the genie said, thank you for freeing me from imprisonment inside this bottle, and for that, I'm going to grant you one wish. The guy thought about it for a minute and said, you know, I'm afraid of flying. I have a phobia also of drowning, so I don't, don't, I've never been on a boat, but I've always wanted to go to Hawaii. Can you build me a bit bridge to drive from the mainland United States to Hawaii? And the genie said, oh no, that's, you know, Hawaii's too far away, the ocean's too deep, please make another wish. So the guy thought about it for a minute and he said, well, I'm an agency administrator and I want to modernize our IT systems so that our people can work efficiently and we can provide better customer service, to which the genie promptly responded, how many lanes would you like on that bridge? <laughs> the perception is often accurate uh, that government is behind the private sector when it comes to IT modernization. Secretary Purdue and I want to try to change that at USDA. We want to make sure that USDA is the most effective, efficient, customer-focused agency in all of the federal government. And a huge component of that, of course, is modernizing our IT systems. Uh, in the last year, we've put into motion a very aggressive plan to, to really try to transform how we do business and to modernize our IT systems. And when you look at it, our opportunity to modernize uh, really impacts uh, all of what USDA does, and they're really far-reaching. Technology, as you know, has the unique ability to transform uh, not only to make things easier for our employees, but for those that we serve uh, and can lead to America's next inventions and innovations. Uh, at the Department of Agriculture, uh, really modernize our, modernizing our IT systems, we believe, really helps our three main groups. One of them, of course, is our employees. USDA is one of the largest uh, departments in all of the federal government. We have over 100,000 people. Um, and so shifting to a data-driven, efficient IT system really allows us, our employees, to work more efficiently and most effectively and, and to do higher value work. Second of all, the second group is our producers. Um, as those who own and operate the farms, the ranches, the forests, uh, private forest lands throughout the co our country, uh, we have the op unique opportunity to really help them expand their ability to interact with USDA, USDA programs, and greatly increase their self-service capabilities. 
And lastly, and this relates once again back to our employees, but also to the people that we serve, modernizing our IT structure and infrastructure really is going to help our scientific researchers. USDA is a very large scientific agency and that the role, the critical role that our scientists play uh, at discovering the next uh, 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 inventions, uh, plant diseases, pest diseases, innovations in food and agriculture really Really depend on scientific computing. As we have looked to modernize our IT systems, one of the areas that we have focused on that we had to get right, first of all, from the get-go is governance. And we have moved uh, from having essentially 19 different CIOs that were operating in silos to having one CIO, Gary Washington, here with us today, uh, along with assistant CIOs in each of the mission areas. We've moved to have a CIO council so that they are reviewing the major IT acquisitions and plans uh, within each of our mission areas and then recommending that on up to an e-board of executives as well. We, we're developing and are implementing a plan to consolidate our end user support organization from 22 different uh, organizations and providers uh, down to one. And as the Lighthouse Agency for IT Modernization, uh, we have and we're very pleased to have the GSA Centers of Excellence working right embedded at USDA uh, and supporting our work in infra infrastructure optimization and data center uh, consolidation, service delivery analytics and the development of executive dashboards that Emily talked about uh, so that we can make better database decision making, cybersecurity, end user support, and customer experience. A key to our success, I think, thus far is the priority that's been placed at the very top on IT modernization, and I think that has really helped. Secretary Perdue, as a two-term governor of Georgia, understood what, how important IT modernization was to transform the Georgia state government so it better served the people of the state. And he's brought that same mentality to USDA about placing that focus from the very top and emphasizing it continually about the need for IT modernization. I think also as part of that, of course, is having the right leadership. And, and once again, I'd like to call out Gary Washington, our CIO, and his team, as well as the great team that we have from GSA that is embedded at USDA. Uh, we partnered with GSA and the Centers of Excellence and we conducted about a six month assessment of what our current needs were in each of those five areas. Uh, we, uh, as part of through that process, we've reduced the time uh, for a system to obtain an authority to operate from nine, an average of around nine months previously to 90 days. And, and that was through uh, engaging in a business process improvement process. We also uh, are, uh, uh, outlined uh, what the desired state was in each of our, those five centers of excellence and with the cost benefit analysis. We also along the way have taken steps to already close 21 of our 39 data centers on the road to having just one with one backup. Um, and we've, of course, administrated uh, or implemented the administrative dashboard capability with data analytics. So far, we've realized around $26 million in cost avoidance and savings. And now we're, of course, moving on and just entered into phase two, which is the actual implementation of the plan that was developed during the first six months. We anticipate that in this phase two, process. It is 12 to 18 months with most of the work being completed within the next 12 months. Of course, that doesn't end, as you well know, the modernization effort. That is just the start. And that's one of the, I think, key benefits that we really see 
with having the, the centers of excellence embedded at USDA is that we're able to sprint in these areas, develop the talent and the expertise, and then when the centers of excellence move on to work with other agencies, maybe your agency and department, uh, we have that institutional knowledge to begin uh, to continue on with our effort. I'd like to talk finally about a little bit what we call our Farmers.gov project. And in February of this year, we launched uh, what released what Farmers.gov, which is a dynamic and mobile-friendly website that delivers information, tools, the ability for farmers and ranchers to apply for programs and services online. Um, and uh, it is an external website uh, that is a customer gateway. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, part of an authenticated and transactional portal where USDA customers can log in, they can apply for programs, they can process technical and financial transactions, and manage accounts. Think of, for instance, the ability today for farmers to be able to apply online for a farm operating loan. Or think, for instance, for the, the ability of the farmer, and in fact, we're seeing this today uh, with the disasters that we're having today, so that a farmer can not only get information about the kinds of assistance that's available to farmers and ranchers as a result of the hurricanes that we've been having, but they can also make the application for those programs, and then that can begin to be uh, processed by our folks so that those services and that assistance can be delivered. We're very excited about that. We're in the early stages, but it's something that we plan to continue to grow. It really does provide our farmers, our ranchers, our private foresters uh, with these self-service tools, uh, the educational materials so that they can find out about the programs and then uh, apply for the programs and can uh, sign up and, and receive the benefits as well. I must say that throughout this modernization effort that we've been going through, clear communication is really the key, uh, making sure that we understand and that we are communicating very clearly not only the needs that we have, but communicating throughout the organization the direction we're going and what we hope to accomplish. I was reminded of some of the pitfalls that can occur when you have abbreviated uh, communications. Last winter, uh, when we had one of our cold snaps in Washington, D.C. I was working late at the office. I got a text message from my wife, and it said, she said, Windows frozen. I responded with the text message saying, try pouring some hot water on them. And a little bit later, I got a message back, now the computer's really fried. <laughs> I want to uh, conclude by just saying it is, uh, we are very excited about the IT modernization plans uh, that we have at USDA, the implementation that, we're, that we have embarked on thus far, and what a pleasure it has been to be, again, working with uh, GSA and OMB and the Centers of Excellence. Many times I was joking earlier that when you say that we're partnering with OMB, GSA, as a federal agency, most federal agents say, really, Do you, or, uh, how's that going so far? And it has been a very good experience and something that we're very proud uh, uh, to do and very excited about the, about the progress that we're making. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you this morning to share a little bit about what we're doing at USDA to modernize our IT systems. And as uh, we say at USDA, do right and feed everybody. Thank you and have a good rest of the conference. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deputy Secretary. We really appreciate your being here today. Every year, OFPP, my office, and the Chief Acquisition Officers Council recognize uh, procurement professionals who contribute to outstanding improvements in federal contracting. In addition to our General Acquisition Excellence Award and our Small Business Award, 
This year, we're pleased to add the Lisa M. Willis Program Management Excellence Award. Lisa, who was the director of the Office of Procurement and Property Management at the Department of Agriculture, passed away suddenly in April of 2017. She was an amazing and talented colleague, and she is missed by all of us. But her commitment to program management and acquisition excellence will carry on. Before we get to the presentation of awards, I'd like to introduce Thomas O. Lynn from the Department of the Treasury to come on stage to help us present the awards. Come on up, come on up. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so Thomas won the CAOC Open Opportunities Contest, and guess what the prize was? Coming to ELC. Uh, yes. So if you're a Fed and you haven't heard of Open Opportunities, I encourage you to explore it. It's a modern way to train the federal workforce through brief exchanges with colleagues offering uh, or asking for expertise on the Open Opportunities platform. Do you need to do an industry day? Post an opportunity for somebody who's done it before and they can come help you develop the agenda. Do you need a frontline view of a proposed policy? Because they're not shy about telling you what they think. Um, Go ahead and post that. You'll certainly get a lot of feedback. Uh, we've posted a number of opportunities and have found that we can reach folks across the country, and they get some experience that they can't get in their regular jobs. It's a win-win for all. So congratulations, Thomas, for helping us promote that. And you can find open opportunities at openops.usajobs.gov. Now, on to the awards. I'd like to invite Joni Newhart, who is our Associate Administrator for Acquisition Workforce Programs, to come on up on stage and tell us all about the winners and the good work that they've done all year. Thank, Thank you, Jenny. Leslie. Good morning, everyone. I gotta tell you, this is the favorite part of the job, right here. <laughs> um, our first award will be the Acquisition Excellence Award, in which we have both an individual and a team award winner. We change the categories each year to reflect our priorities. So this year, we selected Workforce of the Future, innovation, and category management. No surprise to anybody. So please join me in congratulating John Cavadias, the individual winner, who is from GSA's Federal Acquisition Service, who wins in the innovation cav category. Come on up, John. John won the Individual Acquisition Excellence Award for his work in solving the cost realism analysis problem for multiple award IDIQs. He recognized that analyzing cost realism at the master contract level is an inefficient process that does not result in a fair or realistic competitive cost evaluation, although it's required by the FAR. He worked with the GSA General Counsel to logically develop a request for a FAR class deviation which was ultimately approved and will help both government and industry save resources on this non-value added regulatory requirement. Congratulations. <clears throat> great, great award. Our next award is to the team winners, Nathan Briggs and Jared Annable, who are from Customs and Border Protection at the Department of Homeland Security. And they also win in the innovation category. Nathan will be accepting the award because Jared had a pretty good excuse for not attending. He got married this past weekend. <laughs> Nathan Briggs and Jared Annable won the Team Acquisition Excellence Award for their work in merging product demonstrations with testing as part of the source selection process for next generation density meters. Their efforts resulted in a quick contract award of 107 days and a reduction from the $7,000 anticipated price per unit to $2,000. Their show me versus tell me approach has helped to transform DHS's procurement culture by sharing lessons learned with their colleagues. Congratulations. Our next award is the new Lisa M. Willis Program Management Excellence Award. There's our wonderful colleague, Lisa, who we miss. Uh, it's given to either an individual or a team. The winners are the Integrated Strike Program team at the U.S. Special Operations Command. Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey LaFleur, the team lead, will be accepting the award. The ISP team's efforts in using collaborative government industry teaming, which we love, and acquisition flexibilities on the AC-130J program, leveraging existing GPS hardening equipment on the AC-130W program to enable operations in contested environments 
and using other transaction authorities for the rapid fielding of small glide munitions. These efforts, these wonderful efforts, collectively saved $594 million and most importantly, address the most urgent combat shortfalls from the combatant commanders. Congratulations. So last, but certainly not least, we have the Small Business Excellent Award, which is near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, it's given to either an individual or team. The winners this year are Ryan Bird and Kimberly Guest from GSA's Federal Acquisition Service again. And we're delighted that they're both here to accept the award. Come on stage. Ryan and Kimberly combined three previously awarded contracts into one omnibus contract to support the Counter Rocket Artillery Mortar CRAM program for the Army. Ryan and Kimberly did extensive outreach to you all to industry, which helped inform their path forward. Through their efforts, the government saved $37 million, which is really important, but also was able to increase the share of work sent to small business by 57% or $140 million. Great effort. Thank you, and again, another round of applause for all of the winners. Great efforts. Thank you, Joni, and congratulations again. So now I would like to introduce Tim Cook, who is the ACT IAC Program Manager for the Institute for Innovation. Tim, come on up. I see you. Good. Uh, so yesterday, Margaret Weikert talked a little bit about the President's Management Agenda and the important work that agencies are doing to modernize IT, make better use of data, and build a 21st century workforce. So in order to make this happen, our acquisition system, which supports over $500 billion in federal contracts each year, needs to modernize as well. So I was really excited when ACT IAC asked me to be the government liaison to ELC because I wanted to highlight the importance of the acquisition system in mission delivery. We want to shift the culture of the acquisition community away from the process-driven sort of compliance-focused model that we've got to a more outcome-based model. Um, and so what we're doing, uh, Tim's going to talk a little bit about it, but what we're doing generally, we've stood up acquisition innovation advocates in each large agency. Who has heard of the acquisition innovation advocates? Okay. I need the marketing department to get on that one. Yeah. Um, okay, so, that, so in every large agency, we've got somebody who is focused on bringing innovative thinking into the acquisition space. Um, we created the Digital IT Acquisition Professionals Program thanks to uh, USDS and, and to Joni Newhart and, uh, and her team. So we're doing a lot of great work. We're leveraging the work that Soraya Curry is doing at DHS and the Procurement Innovation Lab to kind of bring all of this full circle so that we've got more innovation in the system that we've already got and also thinking about what else we can do even beyond the system to make acquisition work. So we're partnering with IX um, Institute for Innovation to drive some very specific solutions. So I wanted Tim to come up and talk a little bit about that today. Tim. Okay, great. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, we did have a few slides. I'm not sure if they're going to show up, but I will be able to uh, talk you through them. Um, so the Institute for Innovation uh, is, not only cares about IT innovation, uh, but also cares about acquisition innovation. Uh, and so they started a project um, which is act IAC's attempt to support Leslie and her team to foster the adoption of great ideas in acquisition innovation for fostering IT modernization. Uh, we're collaborating with the um, uh, acquisition uh, COI and with the IT uh, management and modernization COI as well. So we've got a bunch of people involved. Um, if I could get the um, next one, please. So we've organized the work of uh, many volunteers already, uh, and we've launched this effort this summer uh, in four work streams. The work streams are about what are we buying, how are we buying it, what are the new authorities that we have to buy, and what, who are the innovative organizations out there uh, from a buying perspective. Uh, so in the first area of what are we buying, uh, we're calling this our problem focus, it's already come up this morning, uh, as a service, cloud, uh, new technologies, uh, uh, software development, cybersecurity, the things that we're buying that are part of the IT modernization plan. Um, that's the focus of that group. What they're finding so far is that a variety of agile uh, approaches to these uh, acquisitions are proving successful. 
already. Um, and again, they're in a discovery phase right now, uh, and they're out to discover more of what people are doing. Uh, from the process side, uh, this is more about how we're buying, right? So show me, tell me has already come up this morning. That's a very rich approach to actually getting your hands on to a technology or a solution. Um, in addition to uh, orals type presentations or other uh, presentations like orals and demos uh, and alternative evaluation uh, approaches like comparative evaluations. Um, so that's what that group is doing. They're organizing their work into a periodic table of elements. Who remembers chemistry? Um, so what they've done is bro broken down the acquisition life cycle into a periodic table, and they're using that to organize all the various innovations that they're discovering out there that people are actually doing today. Um, the third area is special authorities. And the special authorities, uh, I mean, people often think of things like OTAs or challenges or prizes. These are special authorities. They're not usually in the FAR. Um, there's a really special one at, at NTIS, uh, which is uh, innovative data solutions uh, where they have, are able to create joint venture partnerships with the private sector to bring those innovative data solutions to agencies. Um, so that's a special one as well. So all those special authorities is the subject of the third group. Uh, and then there's a really a high level of interest in uh, Leslie's team on who are those innovative buying organizations out there? Who's actually trying new stuff? Who's seeing if it can work? Who's seeing if we can expand the aperture uh, beyond what we typically do, uh, as she said, away from compliance-based to outcome-based? Um, and so we're identifying the organizations. We found that two-thirds of the CFO Act agencies already have activities in motion uh, that are intended to to provide innovation in buying. Uh, what are the attributes of those organizations? How do they work? Can other people adopt those kinds of approaches? Um, so let's go to the next one. Uh, so yeah, you can see it up there. Okay, so this is just an example. This is a very early uh, web page uh, that is on Leslie's uh, homepage. Uh, and it's uh, early results of, of the um, the focus area three, the, the, special, um, the special authorities group. Uh, and so they posted this up there. You can see the website. I encourage you, if you want to uh, go to that website, see what's there. Um, this is just a very preliminary um, encapsulation of what they found. So the next slide. Uh, so this is really who's doing it. Um, and we've got a great team of leaders. There are many, dozens of volunteers already involved in this. Uh, Ellery Taylor, Tim Denning, and Frank Kuschel have done a great job so far with this uh, focus area one, the problem uh, approach. Uh, and then Dave Zvenich and Gisa Sateri, who's here, uh, are leading the process focus. Um, Arnie Kravitz uh, with, uh, with Leslie's team uh, and others are leading the special authorities and Dan Jenkin, uh, again, with Leslie's team and others. So what I would like to do now is just to say, we've got a great start. This is a huge landscape. There is a lot going on. There are questions this morning that directly pertain to what this group is doing. Uh, and what we hope to be able to provide are answers to your questions that you've been asking this morning. How do we, what do we do to innovate the acquisition business of government so that it can buy tomorrow's technology today and not yesterday's technology tomorrow. Okay, so that's the goal. We're gonna get there. Uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting effort. If you would like to volunteer, we have lots of folks who are uh, acquisition oriented in the, in the volunteer group already. If we could get some more folks with an IT, uh, kind of the what are we buying? Uh, and what does that really mean? So it's, a, it's definitely an overlapping team. We need to know what we're buying and how we can buy it. Uh, Mike Howell will be your point of contact. I would love to get some more volunteers for all of these teams, uh, and thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Tim.
so that was a, that was a commercial for uh, volunteerism. So please, uh, if you're interested in any of those areas, and we really do need great thinking when it comes to the acquisition space and how we can innovate and be responsive um, to our customers and to the public. Um, so now um, I would like to invite Tony Scott back to the stage so that we can run through um, the second part of the agenda. Thanks, Leslie. I'd like to invite Steve O'Keefe to come to the stage and join me. Um, uh, where did Steve go? Here he is. Meritoc and AppDiac's Reimagining Government IT Study sounds out the state of IT modernization, exposes challenges, and shakes out how to make things better. More than IT examining our own navel, the report pulses 300 finance, procurement, and IT pros for 360-degree insight. Top-line takeaways. We're at a tipping point. 83% of Fed say mission success depends on IT modernization. Biggest change drivers, Cyber EO, Cloud Push, followed by MGT and Fatara. And agencies aren't just talking modernization. 76% expect a spike in IT modernization budgets in FY19. But while IT, finance, and procurement agree on the imperative, they don't see eye to eye on progress. 43% of finance leaders say wholesale change is happening now, versus 27% of IT and 24% of procurement leaders. And if they disagree in spots, they agree vehemently in the need for workforce development and training. Just 28% feel confident in their agency's investment in workforce IT training. Have we piqued your interest? Download the full story on federal IT modernization at meritalk.com. Imagine the possibilities for America. Steve, thanks for doing this uh, survey. I think it was uh, uh, a really interesting sort of insight into what's going on in this uh, pretty exciting space. So do you want to lead us through what, uh, what you found? That would be great. Good morning. I'd like to say how impressed I am with how many people there are here this morning considering how the party was going last night. <laughs> There's obviously some real stamina in government IT. <clears throat> so reimagining government. It's an interesting idea, but as we're all talking the talk about reinventing and reimagining, are we actually walking that talk or are we, just, are, we, are we just talking about it? And so what we wanted to do with this study, we were excited for the opportunity to partner with ACT, IAC, and also to sit down with Suzette Kent and her team at OMB to put together a study that would look at what we're actually doing, candidly to cut through the BS, find out where we're making real progress, and try and find out where there are opportunities for us to get modernization to really blast off. So I have been referred to as a space cadet by a few people over the years. My name is Steve O'Keefe. I'm the founder of Meritalk. Uh, <clears throat> we are the leading federal IT publication. We also put on conferences. Analyst-type uh, reports come out from our organization. We also routinely testify on both the House and Senate side on federal IT issues and workforce issues. And of course, I'm delighted to be joined by the Neil Armstrong of federal IT on the stage, a man that really needs no introduction in these orbits. So what have we got? The report itself. Uh, we're just going to be able to hit the highlights this morning, but if you're interested in getting the whole study, you can get it from meritalk.com. You can also get it from the ACT IAC website. We also have a video, infographics, and sundry different ways of, of consuming the information. But again, the whole study is available at meritalk.com. It's free if you want a closer encounter with the data. So what we did in sitting down again with OMB was look at who should we survey in order to get some more interesting revealing data. And so this is not about IT examining its own navel. Uh, we went out to 300 folks, 100 in procurement, 100 in finance, and 100 in IT to understand where we're actually making progress, where there's alignment, um, and what we can do to get things moving. Now, if this is a uh, good news, bad news type scenario, I think it's usually better to start off with the good news. And Tony, you tend to be a sort of half full kind of astronaut, so maybe you could lead us off in the, getting us on the good foot. Sure. 
<clears throat> so obviously the survey points out that there's mind share around this. Um, and I'm especially excited about that because unless you get people's minds around something, it's hard to actually uh, make any progress. And I'm even more excited about the 94% number uh, around momentum, which says hopefully things are accelerating and, and moving in the right direction faster. So to me, this was a good news, um, maybe even great news uh, sort of story. Yes, I don't know if those of you remember, but uh, Meritalk put on a conference in 2011. It was called Innovation Nation. And <clears throat> the tagline for that conference was Shake IT Up. And in the middle of the keynote, CIO keynote at lunchtime, we experienced our first earthquake in Washington, D.C. So be careful what you wish for. But it does seem like there is a seismic shift in uh, government IT that 94% says that they can feel uh, us moving towards a future state. Now, they say that uh, money talks and BS walks. And so I thought this was an interesting, it doesn't need a whole lot of explanation. 76% expect a spike in IT modernization budgets. So that's a good sign. We're moving in the right direction. There's, there's uh, positive momentum. There's talk about uh, reallocating budgets. <clears throat> and so the next question we wanted to look at was sort of prompted by the Spice Girls. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. <laughs> and what we see is the most important tech for the future is cybersecurity, data management, infrastructure. What you see is there are essentially nine buzz phrases coming up on the rail. There's not a whole lot of light between them, but there's a lot of appetite for these changes. But what's really important from an outcome perspective is really one, two, three, right? Increased efficiency, increased cyber resilience, and data accessibility. These are the things that we're looking for as far as outcomes go. So it's more power to Uncle Sam's elbow, but make sure that we lock all the doors and windows. Now, Tony Scott famously told us that the federal government spends 80% of our federal IT budget on life support for geriatric legacy systems that should have been euthanized years ago. Um, Tony, maybe you could uh, pick up on that here. <laughs> well, and it's not just 80% uh, of the spend, it's also the efficiency of that spend, as we've talked many, many, many times, is not great. The, bang for the buck that you're getting for that 80% is not uh, you know, well spent in my view. So um, the whole idea behind modernization was spend money better on the right things. Um, and uh, I think overall there's big uh, savings uh, if, you, if you can do that. So I think this is an interesting set of statistics. Um, the, the view is pretty closely aligned between finance, IT, and procurement, it looks like. Yep. So again, I think there's general agreement on the problem. What to do about it, I think, is where you know, some of the interesting challenges come, yeah. obviously. I think what we see is that the investment profile that's being projected is pretty much consistent with what we've done in the past. This is where we sort of turn the corner and start looking at some of the challenges and conflicts that may have been exposed in the data. Somebody once said, if you do what you did, you'll get what you got. Everybody loves Abbott and Costello. And so who's on first? What are your IT modernization priorities? There's more data than this in the actual study, but what we wanted to do was look at the three areas where there was most divergence among the three audiences, IT, finance, and procurement. So the number one priority, hardly surprisingly, is cybersecurity. Of course, we remember the OPM breach um, and the cyber sprint, which of course you, uh, you drove, Tony. Um, but IT sees cybersecurity significant, as being significantly more important than our other two uh, important audiences. Number five on the list was workforce, uh, which was somewhat disappointing. Procurement, this is IT workforce training. Procurement sees it as being more important than IT or finance, which I found somewhat surprising. And the focus on workforce is really very important because we'll talk about that in the next slide. People are looking to Workforce is a critical factor in order to get this done, but it only came in number five as far as priorities go. And then in the caboose, uh, number seven out of seven, uh, which is don't be your sleepy or bashful, I can't remember which, um, was citizen service. 
And as we look at some of the priorities that are put out there from OMB and GSA and, and some of our leaders, citizen service is very important. So the fact that it scored so poorly and the fact that IT uh, didn't really see it as a major priority is something of a concern. So again, looking at alignment and misalignment. Now to pay off that conversation about workforce, some interesting statistics here. So while everybody's looking for IT modernization, change, reimagination, 85% say they can't have a modern technology infrastructure and set up without the appropriate modern workforce. So I want things, I recognize that, uh, that workforce is critical here to making a difference. But look at this as we drop down to the lower statistics, very few folks are very confident about their agency's workforce preparation plans. Lowest on this list, as you see, is IT at 16%, procurement coming in at 26%. And then we look at the difference between our audiences, right? There's quite a lot of light between IT and finance. So finance, 43% of finance folks feel like we are, they are confident, whereas only 16% of IT folks feel confident. And so where we see those significant divergences we believe those are the areas where we're having, they're going to drive the big challenges for us in terms of getting it done. Steve, one of the things I think that's really interesting there is we've had a lot of support from industry on some of the other challenges. Yep. Cybersecurity, obviously, everybody's in, you know, sort of uh, full effect and in, in, in some of the other areas around modernization uh, as well. What this data tells me is maybe we got to work a little bit harder on some of the people and workforce development uh, issues and get more industry engagement on that particular topic. I think you're absolutely right. And so this slide sort of picks up that, uh, that friction. Um, again, where we see federal leaders are more likely than those on the front lines to say that they provided the training that's required. Look at that, so 55 versus 40%. So again, some misalignment. And then front, frontline pros are more likely to say agencies should increase investment in employee reskilling and training. So the leaders and those on the front lines are not seeing eye to eye. And so what we're looking for is those areas where there's synergy and confluence, but also those areas where there's divergence. Because I think in many cases where there are divergence uh, issues, we have an opportunity to perhaps bring folks together and cross train. Yeah, absolutely. So as we sort of return back to our spaceship and look over our shoulder um, <laughs> at a distance, the three big takeaways I would say from the study are keep the good stuff going on, right? There are some very positive metrics in here in terms of the inflection point, uh, in terms of the funding priorities. Those are, those are great things. But people, people really matter. And I think you know, the, the big takeaways here are some of the divergence and the workforce issues consistently. We cannot have uh, a modern infrastructure and a modern IT setup in the federal government, a improved environment without investing more heavily in our people. And lastly, the village people, right? It takes everybody coming together. This is not, we need to make sure that finance, procurement, and IT are all on the spaceship as we set off and are on our voyages of modernization discovery. Super. Well, thanks, Steve. I really appreciate it. And, you know, this survey sort of told me what I kind of felt um, but didn't have any data around, which is our biggest priority has to be now on the uh, workforce sort of issues as we go forward, even as we continue momentum on some of these other things. So thank you, thanks for your partnership. I really appreciate it. I'd like to just say thank you to our sponsors for the program. That's AWS, Verizon, Intel, Dell Technologies, Booz Allen, VirtuStream, ServiceNow, Fortinet, Trustwave, and Verizon. Without your partnership, this type of research would not be possible. If you can't get enough Meritalk, this evening we'll be hosting the reception uh, after the dinner, which I think is at the Field House, so that should be, um, that should be a good time. Uh, make sure that you uh, don't stay too late because Suzette Kent is on first thing tomorrow morning. We all look forward to uh, hearing from her. And again, if you're interested in downloading the study, it's free. Go to meritalk.com. You can get the, the video, the infographic, and the full report. Thank you so much, Great. Tony. Thanks, Thank Steve. You. Thank you to Ed
and he throws a good party, so make sure you show up. <laughs> so, on to the conference sessions for the day. Uh, we have another jam-packed day again uh, with a diverse lineup of sessions for you to choose from, and uh, both this morning and this afternoon. The Partner Pavilion will be open right after this morning's plenary session up until this evening's reception tonight at uh, 5 p.m. So please make time to visit the exhibitors during the day. Up on center stage starting at 10.15, you can choose from two sessions back to back, a face-off on whether blockchain is ready for prime time in government, and a fascinating look at how to avoid bias in AI and machine learning. In our track theater starting at 10.30, you again have the choice between four 75-minute sessions. Track Theater One offers a, offers a session from the business innovation track, exploring how data as the new oil can be leveraged to create value to the mission. Track Theater Two offers a modernizing for mission success session with a focus on acquisition, innovation, and the results of the ACAC competition that ACT IAC ran in late summer. And in Track Theater Three, the Enterprise Resilience Tracks host a discussion on zero trust architectures. And in Track Theater 4, our Modernization Track hosts another facilitated interactive session in the Imaginarium, focused on customer experience and how we capture the voice of the customer through empathetic research. In the Techno Showcase Hubs, again, we offer four unique interactive sessions in the Customer Experience Hub. The U.S. Department of Agriculture will lead a discussion on measuring ROI for a customer experience program. In the Cybersecurity Hub, DISA will focus on maturing capabilities that meet tomorrow's threats. In the Emerging Technology Hub, DHS will lead a session on the use of robotics. And finally, in the Modernization Hub, the Department of Justice will host a session that explores the connection between innovation and data. Just like yesterday, participants will engage in interactive sessions in each hub using human-centered design methods to explore potential solutions and strategies. Lunch today, very important, is a networking lunch. Food will be served in the Techno Showcase, Partner Pavilion, and other open areas on the show floor. We'll then roll right into the afternoon programming with sessions continuing in the Center Stage, Techno, and Track Theaters. Igniting innovation sessions start in the Techno Hubs at 1.30 p.m. Then the Techno Hubs <clears throat> roll into another series of interactive sessions from 2.15 to 3.30, and once again, close the day with out-brief sessions at 4 and 4.30 p.m., highlighting the outcomes from all of the Hubs activities that day in case you missed something. Center stage sessions begin at 2.15. First up is a discussion <clears throat> by author Michelle Quaid on how culture can eat innovation for lunch. Then we'll explore an alternative approach to trusted internet connections in the cloud, how, how we can automate security authorizations to unclog ATO backlogs, and the center stage series will end with a look at quantum computing. Boy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Our track sessions continue through the afternoon with 75-minute sessions beginning at 2.15 and then another round from 4 to 5. So there's too much detail here to share on the eight sessions. Please check your pocket agenda or the ACT IAC app for more detail. So whether your interest is in the Techno Technology Modernization Fund pioneers, the security of our election infrastructure, the future of the networks with EIS, or how artificial intelligence is impacting the government, there is a session for you. So after the sessions end at 5 p.m., we'll meet in the Techno and Partner Pavilion area for a reception, then move back here for the evening plenary session where we have another great keynote speaker. So lots of detail. There's a lot of good stuff over there. We'll see you back here at 6 o'clock. Thank you. All right. Thank you.